This is my father's world. We're going to love that song. No air seems to be ruling. You know, it seems sometimes the world's so bad, so corrupt, you're just like, how in the world can God be in this? And, of course, God is. God is ruling all, and all will be held accountable one day for the very things that go on. And we can be like Job and uh, look at it and say, boy, just how can that be? But uh, we can be like Daniel and also see that God brings down kingdoms, he raises up kingdoms, and wickedness will be punished both in this life and in the one to come. Good to see you this evening. We're glad you're here from Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. One of the things I wanted to mention before we got started was Ed Troxell. Ed uh, was not even able to make it to his family, the, the Poe family, uh, Janie and Susie and uh, Dorothy May's family had their... Uh, holiday party here yesterday get together you know and he was not even able to make that he is just not feeling well if you could remember him i know he would appreciate that ed one of our elders here and he's just not having a good a good time right now he's got some things going on so remember ed also uh, helen stewart she uh, you know she had that fall that kind of sent her to the hospital and then to the rehab center but she's got some other things going on she uh Apparently, her mind is telling her left side of her body, you know, to move and things when she doesn't really want it to, arm and leg. and So I know she would appreciate your prayers, too. Like I told you a few weeks ago, last time I'd seen Wesley, he was looking real good. But the doctor has since told him that, uh, you know, he had to have double knee surgery. Uh, he had some infections in his knees. And the doctors told him that he just may not be able to walk on that right leg again. So... Remember him. He's in rehab a couple hours a day. And just remember all of our sick. This is a tough time of year. It's a tough time of year on young folks. But it's a tough time of year on old folks, and particularly those that have respiratory issues already. Let's, let's remember those in our prayers and, and, and uh, think about those that are, that are sick. <clears throat> As I said, we're in Galatians. We've been looking at the book of Galatians. We're in the sixth chapter tonight. We'll finish it up. We said that the churches of Galatia, you know, Paul started those, his first missionary journey. And as we'll see at the end of Galatians chapter 6, he bears the marks in his body. And part of the marks that he bore would be a couple of good whoopings he took on that first missionary journey. Uh, perhaps some things happened in Antioch and Pisidia, but definitely uh, Lystra, you'll remember, he was practically stoned to death. Uh, some teach, you know, some believe that he was stoned to death and God resurrected him. Others believe that he was almost dead and, and was able to, uh, you know, God uh, helped him. But uh, either way, he was in pretty bad shape. So when he talks later in this chapter about bearing marks in his body, uh, the scars in his body that say, hey, I am of Christ, uh, he had literal physical scars. Even though in the pagan day, uh, you know, they would tattoo you or they would uh, sometimes use a brand. It was very popular to use a brand in uh, pagan rituals to um, show their adherence to that particular religion. Well, we've said in Galatians chapter 6, and now we're going to look at the application. I mean, this is as practical as about anything you can get to. We've divided this book up. It's convenient to divide it up into Galatians 1 through 3, being sort of the doctrinal kind in, verses, in chapters 4 through 6, uh, being the practical kind. I know I've got teachers that get on to you for saying such things because doctrine is practical. I get that. But, um, you know, the last part of the book is generally do this, don't do that. I think it's easier and it's more clearer, maybe more specific would be a better word, to divide it up into three different groups, and chapters 1 and 2 being the defense of the apostleship and his gospel. Remember, he tells them, I marvel you're so soon removed from him that called you into the doctrine, uh, you know, to another doctrine, but which is not another. And then he goes on to say, though an angel from heaven teach any other gospel than that which we have. You know, it's amazing. You have people today who believe that if an angel were to come up and tell them something, well, that would be the truth, and I need to follow that. But in Galatians chapter 1, the Bible is very clear that if an angel comes up and tells you something different than you have in the New Testament, that that angel should be accursed, any man or angel. And yet there's those today that believe that, uh, you know, the angel uh, can tell you something different. That's just not the way. Paul gets on to these uh, churches in Galatia, and this is in the first century. Well, chapters 1 and 2, he's going to defend his apostleship. He'd even talk about how... He went to Jerusalem in Galatians chapter 2, and now that even though Titus was with him, he was not compelled to be circumcised. See, you have these Judaizing teachers that are trying to convince the New Testament Christians there that they need to keep the old law. They're teaching them false doctrine. And Paul is saying, that's not so. You don't need to do that. And so that's what happens in chapters 1 and 2. 
Chapters 3 and 4, he's going to talk about justification. And we've used that key word when it comes to justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned. Justification. And that it's not by the law of Moses, but by the faith of Christ. And he'll contrast the law, the law of Moses, with the faith of Christ, or the law of Christ, as we'll see it's even referred to here in Galatians 6, throughout this book. does the same exact thing in the book of Romans, except it's a little bit more extended. I like looking at the book of Galatians. It helps me remember what Romans is about, because sometimes you can kind of get lost in the book of Romans due to just the, the enormity of the information. And then the last part of the book, which we're in now, is an appeal, appeal to steadfastness, faithfulness, and duty, and that's where we are now. And then we looked last week at chapter 5. Tonight we're going to look at the demands of freedom and pretty much just some, some, concluding, some concluding thoughts at the end of chapter 6. So we're going to look at application of Paul's gospel. Right here in this chapter is where the rubber meets the road. We talked about doing to others, you know, this morning. We talked, you know, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even also unto them. Well, this is the application here. And we're going to see how that when people are overtaken and false, Christians are responsible to each other. In fact, uh, you remember Abel would ask the question of God, am I my brother or Cain? Excuse me, Cain. Abel's dead. Cain would ask, am I my brother's keeper? Of course, what he was trying to say is, you know, if you're worried about uh, Abel, uh, you know, what am I supposed to do, keep up with him? Bottom line is yes, and we'll see that here in Galatians 1. Well, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road in this. We will see the gospel applied to various situations. Much has been made in this letter about not being under law. He had tried to show the law has been abrogated. It's been put aside. You're no longer under the old covenant. There are no longer uh, holy garments, if you will. You don't wear a particular garment that makes you holy. You know, brethren, a lot of folks today, when they preach and teach and so forth, will even have on robes. If they've been designated by their particular denomination, they uh, may even wear all black clothing, uh, may even turn their collar around backwards, we used to say, you know, have the little white thing standing there, and that sets them apart as being a part of the order of priests. Well, the Bible teaches that we are all priests. And you know, some folks even get doctrine like the Sanhedrin, you know, the 70, or the, the apostles uh, of the 12 of the New Covenant, but there is no apostles today. Uh, the apostles were something that took place in the first century. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They could impart spiritual gifts. That's something that was done away in the first century. Today, churches of Christ, God's church here on this earth, is made up of autonomous congregations. And you don't have a group of folks in one area that can, let's say, for instance, Nashville calls down here to South Pittsburgh and says, hey, you boys down there, y'all ain't spending enough time talking about grace, and we want you to do this, and we want you to add this doctrine, and send us information that says we got to do this now. We don't have a central government. There is no uh, hierarchy where there's a, a, you know, a local headquarters or even a national headquarters or a state headquarters for the church of our Lord. Each congregation has its own deacons. Each congregation has its own elders. Each congregation has its own evangelists. And they're responsible for what takes place within the confines of their congregation. The congregation here in South Pittsburgh does not answer to the congregation at Campbell and vice versa. We are autonomous. Does that mean we don't fellowship? Does that mean we don't work together? No, that's not the case at all. But it, when it comes to government, we don't have people in just one location that tell the entire United States what to do. You won't find that in Scripture. That's not what takes place at all. So we're not under law. We're not under that old law. Yes, they had you know, some situations like that in the old covenant, but the old covenant has been done away with. We are under the new covenant. Remember what the Hebrew writer would tell us in Hebrews 9, 16 to 17, for where a testament is, there must also be the death of the testator, for a testament is a force after men are dead. So you've got to die. And that's what Jesus did when he gave the new covenant. He nailed the old one, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, to the cross. And the new covenant came to into effect. And, of course, the gospel would begin to be preached in Acts chapter 2. And that's where people would learn how to be a part of the kingdom of God. So much in this letter of Galatians is you're not saved by the law of Moses. Circumcision doesn't do you anything. As a matter of fact, ye that are circumcised, notice chapter 5, verse 4, you are fallen from grace. In other words, you can be lost for trying to bind the old covenant on New Testament Christians. You're not supposed to do that on, on, the, on the, the doctrine today. But unlike a lot of even our own brethren who we would call antinomiasts or those who are against law, we are under law today. 
We are under the law of Christ. See, if we weren't under law, there'd be no sin because sin is what? A transgression of the law. There's never been a time where man has been on this earth where he was not obligated to God. Uh, you had the patriarchal. You know, I'd like to know more about how they found out the things they did, but I know one thing. Eve knew she wasn't supposed to eat of that tree. She told God, uh, she told the devil straight up. The devil says, can you eat of all the trees? He said, no, we can't eat of this tree. She found that out somehow, whether it came from Adam or whether from the mouth of God. I do not know. I do know that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice, and even the book of Hebrews tells us that he did that by faith. Well, the book of Romans tells me that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Abel knew what God wanted and offered that sacrifice, and he did it because somebody, either his daddy the patriarch or God himself, had revealed it to him that that's what he needed because that's how you do something, by faith. By faith, Abel offered a more <coughs> excellent sacrifice than did his brothers. And remember, his brother got so mad about it, he killed him. Well, let's look at this application. First of all, we're going to talk about Restoration. The gospel preached by Paul does not <clears throat> or allow one to be inactive and uninterested in the welfare of others. We just can't sit on a pew and not care about what's going on in other people's lives, in our brethren's lives. This shows that it's something that we must do. Notice Galatians 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, yes, that means exactly what it says. Brothers, a Christian unlike many of the denominations of this world that would teach you that once you're saved, you're always saved. That's not what Paul believed. That's not what James wrote. Save your place right there and turn with me to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, the last two verses of the book of James. Notice what is said. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, notice a brother in Christ can err from the truth, and one convert him. A Christian can so err from the truth that he has need that one convert him. Notice verse 20. Let him know that he which converted the sinner. In other words, the brother that went and talked to him. Said, listen, you need to fix this. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Folks, you can go out there and restore every erring Christian there's ever been, but they're going to die. This is not talking about a physical death. This is talking about a spiritual death. So the brethren, the Bible teaches that a man can be a child of God and so live his life as to become lost. As a matter of fact, that's what's said in, in chapter 5, verse 4. Remember, ye that are, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> become, uh, if you're justified by the law, you're fallen by grace, fallen from grace. So let's go back to Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual... Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Think about yourself. If you were in a lost state, knowing that, if you died in that state, that you would have, you'd be damned. You'd be going to that place of eternal fire. You'd be on the day of judgment. You'd be on the side with the goats. And the Lord would look at you and say, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. You don't want to be on that side. And this teaches that. As I realize, and this goes right with the golden rule we talked about this morning, right? If I'm in that situation, I'd like somebody to try to help me out. I'd like somebody to care enough about me. Say, Ron, uh, you need to stop this. You need to do what's right and encourage me to do that. Notice that's what's being spoken of here. Do that. Ye which are spiritual, those who are still faithful to God, and realize that this brother's in a lost condition, go out and try to reclaim that brother. Notice verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill. What's that say? Law of Christ? You think Paul just made that up? There's no real law. We're not under law. We're under grace. Well, that's not what Paul said. Paul says when you do this, you're fulfilling the law of Christ. Now, folks, that's a law. If you're under law, you're under law. And you've got to be under law. There's no sin. But we know that men are sinners. Paul would say that all men of sin come short of the glory of God. But let's notice something with verse 2 there. Because it caused me some grief when I was a young Christian. Because I would read verse 5, and it says, For every man shall bear his own burden. Well, no, wait a minute. Over here in verse 2, it says, Bear ye one another's burden. So, you know, I'm supposed to help this brother, but now this here says I've got to bear my own burden. Well, now how do you justify that? You know, heretics and atheists and things of that nature, they want to all the time show how the Bible contradicts itself. This is one of their sugar sticks. They'll say, within three verses here, you've got the Bible saying, Y'all do this, then turn right around and say, Y'all do that. We see there's different kind of burdens people have 
There are the burdens that you can help me with. There are things that you can encourage me. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons we come together, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, is to encourage one another to love and good works. Not forsaking, verse 25, the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is. Verse 24 says we come together, we can encourage each other. And when I see a brother that's going through a hard time, I can encourage him. I can help him bear that burden. But there's certain burdens I have to bear. You see, you cannot be baptized for me. You cannot, as some, you know, some religions would teach, you could baptize somebody for somebody else. You know, somebody may have been dead a long time. Well, you can go back and baptize that person. You can't do that. The Bible says, he that believeth and is baptized. It's talking about that individual. That person's the ones that have their sins remiss. But notice what we have here. I have a responsibility to believe the gospel. You can't do that for me. I've got to do that. You can't obey the gospel. You can't be baptized for me. You can't repent of my sins. Those are things, those are burdens that I have to bear. But there are also burdens that we're to cast upon the Lord. Give our burdens to the Lord, things that are too heavy for us to carry. And Jesus said, I'll help you carry those burdens. Cast all your cares upon him. Why? He careth for you. So three different types of burdens, really. So don't let that be a, a stumbling block for you, as, as I did early on. Because I'd have people from time to time that I would have my Bible at school or something, you know, and they'd say, well, you know, the Bible's got contradictions. And every now and then you'd have somebody that actually looked at it enough to try to find one and say things like that. But don't be fooled by that. We're to bear one another's burdens. I've got a responsibility to you. You've got a responsibility to me. And brethren, we'll stand and we'll stand in judgment on that. You know, if I know a brother, then I just deliberately, you know, just ignore that. I won't have anything to do with that. Brethren, I'll answer for that. Verse 3. For if, for if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Think about that. If I take an examination of myself and I think I'm somebody, the Bible says you better be careful. You better be careful. God says you better be careful. You think you're something and you're not. Verse 4, but let every man prove his own work. Now, that's not talking about your job. That's not talking about what you go out here and do every day. This is talking about your spiritual work. Remember what Paul would talk about in the Corinthian letter about how every man's work will be tried, some will be burned up. And what he's talking about there is, you know, the chaff, the wheat, you know, the stuff that's uh, not solid, not, not good material. And by that, we're talking about spiritual things, not, not physical things. For if a man think, it's verse four. But if every man, but let every man prove his own work, and then he shall, uh, then he shall, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. And then the verse we just looked at a moment ago. For every man shall bear his own burden. So we're talking about registration here. First of all, the possibility that you can be lost. Second of all, the responsibility that when somebody needs restoring, and the restoration I'm here is not talking about the restoration of the church. It's talking about the restoration of an individual. And the restoration of the church, I believe, is an ongoing uh, uh, process all the time. We're trying to restore that New Testament Christianity and do those things that they, would, uh, they did in the first century and will be what they were. Not only that, but being sympathetic. Being sympathetic. You know, back in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, we have the, <clears throat> what we call the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, I, I kind of do an acronym with it, uh, LJP, LGG. FMT, that helps me remember it. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. And then meekness, temperance. And then he says, uh, <clears throat> and such, against such, there is no law. If I operate with those fruits of the Spirit, try to have that fruit of the Spirit, then it's going to make me sympathetic. When I see that, brother, I'm going to have concern for him. He's going to mean something to me because that, indeed, is a child of God. Next, the idea of participation. It's something that... I need to be doing. It's something I need to be involved in. Notice verse 6 here. Let him that is taught in word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now what does that mean? Me and Daniel know exactly what that's talking about because we are communicated with by brethren uh, to, they, they support us. We are evangelists. We are gospel preachers and brethren take of their monies but on the first day of the week they take up a collection and we are given a support from that that's what this is talking about let him that is taught in the word that's the persons that are in the church that are listening communicate that's not just talking about caught with talking to somebody <clears throat> sometimes words are used and they have this idea of, of other stuff involved here one of them, this idea of communicating is the idea of, of paying or supporting it's the same idea we find in James chapter 1 when it says visit the widows and the orphans. Brethren, that doesn't mean I just go over to their house and go, boy, how you guys doing? Man, looks like you don't have any food. 
That's t- <laughs> Boy, I hate that, but I'm out of here. I've made my visit. Well, the idea of visiting there is you, you take care of needs as well. Uh, and so this word has a little bit more involved than just actually saying something to somebody. It's the idea of, of, all, of, of, of paying, of supporting, if you will. Uh, he that preaches the gospel ought to be able to live by the gospel, as Paul would say in the Corinthian letter. Unto him that teacheth in all good things. And then we have that principle, man, we've talked about this, we've looked at it, uh, we know it, we understand it. It is a universal principle in all things. Notice, be not deceived. Don't fool yourself. You know, man's the only, per- the only creature that can do that. He can make himself believe a lie. You won't do that with a dog or something. He realizes something hurts or is hot. You know, you're not going to convince him otherwise. But men, somehow we can know something and we'll deceive ourselves. Notice this. God is not mocked. Literally, God is not looked down the nose at. You're not going to mock God. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, we know from an agricultural standpoint, we looked at the parable of the sower, or we're in the process of looking at the parable of the sower, uh, which could be parable of the soils. And we know that it's a principle. You sow tomatoes, you're going to get tomatoes. You plant wheat, you're going to get wheat. Unless somebody messed up at the feed store or whatever and gave you the wrong seed, you're going to reap what you sow. And the thing with reaping is uh, you always get a whole lot more than you sow. Have you ever noticed that? That's, that's how it works. At least that's how it's supposed to work unless you have a drought or something. You sow some seeds, you know, you might have, what, a few ounces of seeds. But come harvest time, you've got pounds and pounds of tomatoes or pounds and pounds of squash or cucumber, whatever you sow. And that's the same thing in life, spiritual things. You sow to the wind, you are going to reap the whirlwind. You sow to the flesh, you're going to get exactly what you've sown. You're not going to get away from that principle. It is there. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. You can't get away from it. You can't run from it. You're going to reap. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap reap life everlasting it's a principle you can't run from it even in spiritual matters if you're nonchalant if you don't sow to the spirit if you don't put in the time if you don't invest if you don't sow in spiritual matters then you are not going to reap in spiritual matters you don't spend time with the word of god you're not going to know the word of god you don't spend time with your brethren and building them up then you're not going to know your brethren nor build them up you're just not going to reap something that you have never sown and so that's a principle there. Notice verse 9. This used to be a, a good friend of mine. I'd say one of the best friends that I've ever had in the gospel. One of the best friends I've ever had in the church. She was probably 40 years older than me, 30 years older than me. But we were good friends. But she had a heart is it, it, that big. And everywhere she'd walk around with it on her chest. I mean, you know what I'm saying? She cared about people. You knew she cared about you. You knew she cared about other people, and but that heart was so sensitive, and, and she was so easy to upset. Sometimes when you're trying to do good things and you're trying to help people, you're going to have folks say ugly things about you. They're going to see your good works, and I'll tell you what it is, it's jealousy. They're going to see you trying to do something, and they're going to speak evil about it. And the thing about her was that she would uh, she'd take that to heart, and it would just break her heart. And she'd get broke down. I'm telling you, this woman, she would get... She would allow, it was, she was so conscientious. And shouldn't we all be? Shouldn't we be conscientious? And she was, and it hurt her so bad when she would hear how people had said evil things about her when her motives were pure. And I tried so hard to encourage her. And so this became our, our little pet passage, if you will. And we'd tell that to each other. You know, preachers, I know Daniel probably doesn't ever do this, but every now and then we'll have pity parties. And we'll be, oh, woe is me, you know. And we'll talk to our wives. And Stephanie used to listen to that stuff. Now she just tells me to get over it. But, uh, you know, we'll be having one of those little pity parties or whatever it is. And this is the idea. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Listen, the brethren are giving you a hard time. Somebody's giving you a hard time about what you're doing, the good that you're doing. Don't you let that affect you. You keep driving on, brother. You keep driving on, sister. You do what's right. And Lord will take care of them. They'll have to answer for that one day. But don't let that slow you down. Just like the Apostle Paul. Imagine how he could have just let the Judaizers shut him down. He said, you know, everywhere I go, 
These guys are following me. They call me names. They say that my motives are not pure. They say that I'm doing this for money, even though I'm not even taking a check from these folks over here in Corinth, and they still get after me. As a matter of fact, I'm not getting any support from them, and they get after me saying I don't love them because I won't take their support. You can't win with some brethren. He didn't let that stop him. He drove right on, and he'd meet those things head on. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. Why? For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You keep your nose to the plow. You do what's right. And just like with her and me, we tried to encourage each other. Do what's right. The Lord's keeping score. You're laying up those treasures in heaven, and one day they'll be yours. And don't let uh, brethren who are not what they ought to be keep you from doing what you ought to do. Notice verse 10. So we're going to participate. We're going to share gratefully. We're going to sow liberally. Now that's one of the things you remember in the, you know, the second Corinthian letter. Man, that whole letter is about Paul defending himself. But remember, he just takes off in chapter 8 and 9 there and spends two chapters dealing with giving and how well those brethren in Macedonia have done it. And he's encouraging those brethren in Corinth to do the same thing. And he uses those brethren in Macedonia to sow. If you you got to sow to get, you're going to sow a little bit, you're going to reap a little bit. The idea here is to sow liberally because you're going to reap. Serve continually. Notice beginning there in verse 10. We've already looked at verse 9. As we have therefore opportunity opportunity let us do good unto all men now i tell you what the anti-ism church uh, the anti-ism movement that moved through the congregations of our lord particularly pretty heavy about 50 years ago this chapter six was a tough place for them uh because as you can see right here as we have therefore opportunity let us do good unto all men now i hate to hang out our churches uh our uh, brethren's dirty laundry, but I'll tell you one thing. There were some brethren who were just wrong on certain things. One of the things said that you couldn't take any money out of the treasury to help anybody who wasn't a Christian. Well, what does this say right here? As we have, therefore, as we, as a group, as the churches there in Galatia, one of the ways they try to get around a bit, they'd say that's an individual responsibility. Now, a lot of times they're preachers. Well, they wouldn't fool with verse 6 up there. Did you see what it said up there? But let him that is taught in word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Those brethren, those preachers in the anti-movement were taking their money, were taking their salaries from the church treasury. But you get down here to verse 10, they'd say, no, you, you can't do that from the church treasury. You've got to do that by individuals. And that's when our brethren would turn around, hold their feet to the fire and say, okay, what you need to do is stand there in the foyer and take money from each individual that goes through there to do that. You see, what they were trying to do was buying something that was not bound, that wasn't taught, this clearly says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men. Brethren, they'd get so carried away with that, they would say that a person, that's a sinner, could not come into the building and so much as get a drink of water. That'd be wrong because you're using church money to help a person. To, and that's, just, that's just so foreign. As we have opportunity, let us help all men. But notice, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So I have an even greater obligation when it comes to members of the Lord's church, brothers and sisters in Christ. I should try to help everybody I can as opportunity presents itself, but especially my brothers and sisters. Let's move on here, verse 11. He says, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Now, if you spend any time with commentaries on this, it'll drive you crazy because some of the guys will say Paul's eyes were so big that he was writing in these big old block letters, you know. I don't believe that's what he's saying at all. It is believed by some. I do not happen to be those that believe, but I know the Galatian letter is old. It is uh, we're talking about Pauline, Paul's writings. Uh, I kind of have a tendency to believe 1st, 2nd Thessalonians was his first, but uh, there are those who argue and say Galatians was one of the early letters, perhaps maybe even the earliest. I, I wouldn't more argue that a whole lot. I'm by, by sure, I'm sure not an authority on that. But uh, the bottom line was, it was how long it is. And you might say, well, this is not long compared to some others like Romans. Well, Romans wasn't written yet, according to the uh, most people's dating of the book of Galatians. Neither would uh, the Corinthian letter as well. Talking about it being one of the early letters. So Paul's just saying, you see how much that I have written here and, and how lengthy it is. And notice what he tells them about the idea of separation against genuineness, against that which is counterfeit. It says, uh, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. Now, remember what this letter's been about. These Judaizing teachers trying to get these Christians to be circumcised. 
They constrain you to be circumcised. They encourage you. They're really, really pushing this only lest they should suffer persecution from the cross of Christ. Basically what Paul is doing here is questioning the motives of these brethren who are pushing this circumcision. You see, basically it seems they're getting their orders from Jerusalem. They're getting their orders from the Judaizers who are saying, you get them to go ahead and cow to you know, circumcision, <clears throat> and we'll be able to move them closer to obeying the old law as a result of that. Notice verse 13. He says, Paul talking about these folks now. He says, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. He says, these guys are trying to get you to be circumcised. They don't even keep the law. But desire to have you circumcised. Why? That they may glory in your flesh. In other words, they can tell people back in, in uh, Jerusalem, tell people back in Judah, guess what we did? We got all of these folks up here in uh, what would, uh, you know, Galatia be modern-day Turkey. We got all these Gentiles up here, all these goys, as they would say in Hebrew. We got all of these people of the different nations to accept circumcision. We're doing a great work here. Look how great we are. That's what Paul's saying they're doing. He's saying that's their motives. So he's trying to show them that's not genuine. Their motives are not genuine. There's a difference between the law of Moses and the gospel. But notice... Verse 14, <clears throat> but God forbid that I should glory. In other words, I'm not writing to somebody and saying, look what all I've done here. Look how, what a great work I've done here. He said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Notice, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, uncircumcision but a new creature you got to obey the gospel. Remember what happens? The Roman letter talks about you're buried, take the old man of flesh, you're raised to walk what? In newness of life. You're raised as a new creature according to the Corinthian letter. So, no circumcision, but a new creature. Verse 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. You see, the Israel of God here, and boy, I wish that I could get folks to see this I wish people would listen to me uh, I wish people would listen to the Bible more than listen to me but when you talk about the Israel of God I've got people in my own family who would tell you this is what's being talked about this is this is talking about the Jews this is talking about those people that live in Palestine you see if anybody's going to heaven it's them and they totally don't understand what the church of Galatia is talking about what Paul's talking to the Galatian church they don't understand that the Jew and the Gentile are now one in the body, that the middle wall of partition has been broken down, and now today if a Jew wants to be saved or a Gentile wants to be saved, both of them have to obey the gospel. That's the Israel of God. You want to be Abraham's seed? That's what he said in Galatians 3. Those who put on Christ, they're the seed of Abraham. They are Abraham's offspring. For we are all children of Abraham by what? By faith. By faith. So that the Israel of God he's speaking about here is the church. It is not talking about a bunch of folks living in Palestine, who most of them probably aren't the seed anyway. Verse 17, from henceforth let no man trouble me. He says, I know what they've been saying about me. I realize how they've been getting after me and how they're trying to get you to obey the old law. He says, let no man trouble me. He says, I've got the marks. He said, I could take off my shirt, you know, and let you see my back and let you see the lines where I've been whipped. I could let you see the indentations on my head and stuff where I have been stoned. Paul says, I bear in my marks. Now, what he could be doing is making a play here on the fact that a lot of these Gentiles, they would have been a lot of these uh, <clears throat> Gentile Christians would have known very well about all the tattooing, would have known about the branding, that went on with all these different pagan religions, and he could be making a play on that and saying, I, wear, I bear marks in my body, but they're not like uh, branding, or they're not like tattooing. These are the physical beatings that I have taken. And Paul would say that I, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Let no man trouble me. I've got the proof. I'm wearing it on my back, so to speak. You know, there's a couple of times Paul does that. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 or is it 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where he goes on and talks about all the things that he's been through, all the situations he's been in, and here's another place where we see him and we see what he has gone through. In this chapter, we can see his own life here. Notice, I bear the marks. 
It's what's happened to me. Verse 18, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. We can see Paul's own life. He was a branded man. Those marks said, I belong to Christ. What about me? What about you? Brethren, friends, do you belong to Jesus Christ? How do you do that? How do you belong to the Christ? Well, you put him on in obedience to the gospel. What does that involve? In the first century, when Jesus told those apostles to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It didn't take them long at all before we find them doing that very thing. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter is preaching for the first time entrance into the kingdom of God by the washing of regeneration or by the baptism of Jesus Christ. He tells them in a three-point sermon, beginning with verse, uh, what is it, uh, 2 verse 16. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he'll go down through there and, pop, and pull different sections of the Psalms and show them that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And they by wicked hands have taken and crucified and slain him, and it hit home. A lot of those Jews that day believed said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And 3,000 that people that day obeyed the gospel. That means they believed that Jesus was the Christ. They confessed that before men, repenting of their sins. They were immersed in water for the remission of their sins. And guess what the end of that chapter says? The Lord added them to the church. How many churches were there? There was but one. If you'd went up to an apostle and say, what church are you a member of? He wouldn't have said Baptist. He wouldn't have said Methodist. He wouldn't have said Catholic. He wouldn't have said anything besides what are you talking about? There is but one church. There is but one body, Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There has only been one body. There will only ever be one body. And anything outside of that body, anything other than that church, is a false religion. That's the truth, and that's what Paul would have you to know. What did they do? They obeyed the gospel. And as a result of that, it took a few years. It took a few years before Paul or Peter had his uh, visions you remember Acts chapter 10? He's up on the rooftop. Now for years, all they've been doing is baptizing Jews. No Gentiles have obeyed the gospel. Then all of a sudden, Peter has this revelation. Remember, he's hungry. He's up on the rooftop. And he's up there, and all of a sudden, here comes this sheet down out of heaven with all these unclean animals in it. And God says, Peter, kill and eat. Well, Peter's pretty hungry. But he says, not so, Lord. I've never ate anything that's unclean. God says, what I say is clean. Don't you say it's unclean. Well, that happens three times. And he doesn't understand, what is, what is the meaning of this here? I'm having this vision. Knock on the door. You remember the story. Men have come from uh, this, the, uh, and now I've totally lost. Somebody help me out. Acts chapter 10, who is that? Cornelius. Cornelius. Thank you there, totally. I was on a, whoo, you're talking about going backwards. Cornelius, who is a Gentile, who is doing, he's a good man. He's a good man, but an angel appeared to him and said, go get Peter. And so Peter gets this vision. Here's these men from Cornelius says, we've been sent to bring you back. Peter's trying to put it together. He gets there. He says, uh, you know, it's not even right for me to eat with you guys. Why am I here? And then Cornelius starts to tell him. And so Peter starts to preach, starts telling him, well, you know, there's this Jesus and so forth. And about that time, they start speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit comes upon them, remember? And Peter says, they've received what we received in the beginning. Who can forbid water? So there you have Peter exercising those keys twice that were given him by Jesus. Once to the Gentiles, Acts chapter 10, once to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. He's giving the terms of admittance into the kingdom just like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16. Cornelius is baptized. Now you've got Gentiles. And if we find immediately that you have brethren going up into Samaria in Acts chapter 8, they're going into all these pagan nations now. And the gospel goes into all the world. And you know what people did? They heard the gospel, believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. They were baptized for the remission of their sins. And the Lord added them to the church, and the church grew like crazy. And the same thing can happen today, does happen today, when a person, when that seed is sown, the Word of God, the New Testament, when that is sown in the honest heart, and a person wants to obey the gospel, if they can do that very thing, and they'll be just what those people were on the day of Pentecost, a New Testament Christian not an it or an it or an ism or anything else. They'll simply be a member of the Lord's church, a Christian. 
Don't you think we could get everybody to agree to that? We can all agree to the Bible. Even the religions that have other books, they'll say, well, it starts out with the Bible. Why can't we get folks to put those other books aside? Put, book, put aside those creeds. Put aside those teachings of men, which Paul said, if an angel from heaven preached another gospel to you, and that which you've received, let him be accursed. If we could just do that, maybe we could fix our world's woes. If you're here this evening, you need to obey the gospel. Maybe as a child of God, just need to repent of something done publicly or just need the prayers of the church. We stand ready to help you in any way that we can. Would you come? Together we stand and sing.